Please begin. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, thanks, everyone, for participating in today's Narraro uh, monthly call. Uh, we Today, we have a very interesting discussion on the ICANN accountability and transparency, which will happen after a few things, uh, introductory remarks by myself. And uh, and basically, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, we, I don't know if you know, but we have a new ALS in the region. It's the uh, EDP University of Puerto Rico. And today I invited the two representatives, that's Pablo Rodriguez, that maybe Dr. Pablo Rodriguez, that maybe many people uh, know him from the CCNSO Council and uh, Mayra Figueroa, which is the chan chancellor of the EDP University of Puerto Rico. Pablo will be the rep that will be coming to this meeting and Mayra will be the uh, rep, you know, when Pablo cannot come. So I invited them to introduce uh, the ALS to you and so you know who they are. So Pablo, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, thank Eduardo. So much, I hope Eduardo. that my audio, hope that my audio is, audio a, little is a little bit better than before. Than before. And, I and I do appreciate this appreciate opportunity, opportunity to, to uh, introduce, uh, introduce ourselves, ourselves as the institution, the institution, EDP University's EDP University institution, institution, which is, which is um, a, technical a technical institution. institution. It is a private, non-for-profit non university, university that offers programs, that offers programs from, from undergraduate, undergraduate to graduate, to graduate students, students to, to graduate, to graduate programs, programs, as well in nursing, nursing technology, technology from, from programming, programming, networking, networking um, um, digital security, digital fraud security. investigation, Investigations and a number of other uh, programs which are quite interesting. So I invite you all to uh, visit our website. At the moment, it's in Spanish only, but uh, you can still get a gist of what we offer. Um, it is with me, accompanying me. It is my distinct privilege to have our Chancellor, uh, Dr. Mayra Figueroa, and she has been uh, a proponent. And a champion, a champion of having this, of having this relationship with the at-large, at large. and we are really, and we are looking, really forward looking forward to continuing um, 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 collaborating, collaborating with you. With Unfortunately, Unfortunately, as you know, I can 73 did not occur, did not occur. Um, but um, we hope but that we soon, hope that soon we'll, be we'll be able to see you all face to face, face and spend face time, with time with you in Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico uh, with, uh, with uh, and, uh, in and in our university, university as well as, well as in the IUCAN meeting. meeting. So with so that, with Chancellor, that, if you Chancellor, would like to say a few words, you're more than welcome. More than welcome. You're muted. You're muted. Good afternoon, Good to, afternoon all. to all. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Mayra Figueroa. I am the Chancellor of the Pay University, University uh, 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 the Ray uh, San Juan uh, campus. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me pleasure to join to you join in this you meeting. In Meeting. Uh, um, um, I am very, I am very, very, uh, very proud of, proud of being part of the, part of the of this uh, initiative, this, uh, initiative and, and, and uh, we will be uh, working, will be working, and, working and, and collaborating. Collaborating. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to you all. Thank you to you all. Uh, thank you, Mayra, and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, you know for. Uh, being here today and, and thank you for uh, being part of the uh, uh, of the family and a lot of family in, in uh, so welcome and and we hope to see you around uh, going forward yes we know Paulo EDP University so uh, I want to uh, give the floor to Glenn he's going to talk about election updates uh, and some present new presentation topics and uh, and the introduction of a new individual member, Michael Palage. So, Glenn, you have the floor. You need to mute. You're 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 mute. You're muted. Yeah, I think I was yeah, muted I by was staff. Muted by uh, staff. Uh, so I'm uh, unmuted so now. I'm so muted. you can hear me okay. So you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, welcome, everybody. And I was just saying, was just welcome saying, to our new members, and, uh, new members and, uh, and, uh, and thank you for, for coming today. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, part of a, a process of a that, that, uh, that Eduardo, has, Eduardo uh, conceptualized, has conceptualized, and it's been working, and it's quite, well. working quite well. All of last, All of last year, year, we've been, we've uh, been focused, on focused on issues and topics issues that are very hot issues that were within their community that require, you know, elaboration or clarification. So today's session will be focused on the same thing but I have a bit of as secretariat I have a little bit of work to do outside of our our educational series so I want to talk about the election for a minute so we don't have it hammered down yet into exact timelines so I'm giving you the rough timelines since the staff can can post it but roughly it follows the same sequence it starts in May the announcement and we have in our bylaws with Morello a 30-day notice that the election, the election is coming up. So roughly May 7th, and it's going to be uh, give or take a day or two, the announcement for the call for the nominations. Then it goes through a whole process um, of uh, the deadline for acceptance by roughly May 30th. And uh, the election week is, is again in early June, roughly uh, June 7th to the 11th. So uh, right now, uh, 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 Eduardo and, and myself are working with staff to make sure that the people who are active um, make sure they uh, update their information so that their their ballots are cast properly. So we're in the midst of uh, advocating for the uh, the heads up. The, the, the positions are the open. Positions there's, are two. Open. there's two. Uh, Eduardo, uh, Eduardo Diaz, Diaz has served uh, Norello very well, Norello very but he's well, not serving he's again. Not serving again. Uh, uh, so the chair so position the will chair be position open. Will That's, be a two open. Year That's a two-year term. And one position, and one position with ALAC. With ALAC. Uh, the secretary uh, the non-com position, non-com position non-com myself a secretary, is a two-year, two-year term. So this is my first year or two. And Judith Hellerstein of non-com is in the first year of her two-year term as well. So again, to repeat, the two uh, positions, the, two the positions, chair and the chair one ALAC spot will, will be becoming will be available. Become so that's available. the so that's quick the update quick on the on election. The election. And, as soon as and as soon as staff provides us with, provides uh, us with the, firm uh, the firm dates and the, and the, the, uh, the uh, wiki page, we'll wiki be sharing that with you all. And the other part of what Eduardo has asked me to do is Again, uh, ask Again, all of you ask of topics, topics of policy topics, topics issues, issues that are issues that close are to your heart, to uh, your heart uh, uh, that, you uh, that you need clarification on, clarification or suggestions, on, suggestions of speakers, of speakers uh, to come up uh, to with come uh, topics. With, uh, topics. We have our March and April March topics April set, set, and I'll leave it to Eduardo um, to, um, to talk Edward about the March event and how we plan for that one because it's corresponding with the ICANN meeting. And then we have the April where we we, uh, uh, again, respond, uh, again to, uh, respond to uh, David Mackey's, uh, Mackey's uh, suggestion, uh, he suggestion he needed, and I think it would be beneficial, it to, would be beneficial to, all to all on all the Kinterest framework. The so that framework. session is so being, session organized being organized in, um, in, uh, for April. But for April. we're very much we're open very for much the, open other the other months. If there's, if there's any other topics any that other are close to your heart, please step forward, let me know, and we can work on getting the speakers. And we try to have them like today. Uh, today, uh, two people. Uh, two people. Uh, they may be, uh, they may be complementary or they may be in contrast, but contrast, we really don't know until we started. So that is, so uh, that please is, uh, get a hold of me at my email at or at Mardo, and I'd be happy to do that. And the last that. thing you the have me on this is the welcome Michael Pelage. may have known Michael from years and years. He was one of the early board members with ICANN as well. And we'd like to welcome Michael as well. Is he on the call today? Is he on the call today? He is not. He is not. Okay. Well, thank okay. you so much. Well, uh, okay, so, so okay. I'm going to turn so it back I'm over to, back uh, over to uh, yourself, uh, yourself, Eduardo. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Glenn, for those words. Uh, uh, this is not. Uh, we wanted a little bit of an update from from the NOMCOM. Our uh, representative, you did, uh, Hellerstein. Uh, she's uh, going to join us later, so maybe we can give her a few minutes at the end of the presentation uh, to give us an update on the NOMCOM, how that's going. So let's jump into this presentation, and I'm going to let uh, uh, our moderator today, is going to be Glenn McKnight, an excellent moderator, so he's going to take it over now. And you have the floor, Glenn, and... Uh, 
please, uh, you know, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them in the uh, chat and we'll try to answer them or pass them to your, uh, uh, to the presenters. Thank you. Glenn? Great. Thank you so much. I, so I, much. Um, I, I, I would be a mess of not mess recognizing our Hans Budman. Uh, so I, I just uh, wanted, so to, I just wanted to, to give an opportunity to, to Herb, to Herb uh, just to, uh, just to say, a couple uh, of words. say a couple of words. I don't. Hi, Glenn. Uh, uh, Herb here. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. I'm, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, I'm multitasking here. I'm, uh, we're having a bit of a, uh, a problem with one of our horses here on the farm, so I've, I've got a I'm walking between the barn and the house. But uh, thank you for uh, thank you for for uh, mentioning that I'm on the call, and I'm just going to say hello to everybody in the in the North American region, and uh, wish you all the very best. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you in. Uh, in June, and I'm really and looking I'm forward to getting really back, to, uh, back to, uh, to Puerto Rico like Puerto everybody Rico else, like uh, everybody else uh, when, the time comes. when the time comes. So take care, everybody. So stay, take care everybody. stay safe and, uh, be, safe kind. and uh, be kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you again. Okay, so okay. let me jump in. Uh, so uh, what we have today is uh, our topic is I can accountability and transparency. We were actually discussing this topic a couple of months ago, and then we saw quite a bit of um, uh, discussion in the at-large list, uh, coincidentally, uh, but uh, on, on a, you know, not associated with that discussion. It was something that we felt it was an important issue to bring up. And yes. so I just want to reiterate what uh, we've been saying that we're going to be focused on today. I can believe that the accountability and transparency framework, ETF, is the foundation to encourage participation and still trust make information accessible and and have sound dispute and review mechanisms for the multi-stakeholder model to operate effectively. So we're going to be delving deeper into this concept, how effective ICANN has been. And we've invited our two guests to talk about uh, this topic. So let me just do a quick introduction. Jeff Newman, everybody knows Jeff. I think his video is open. A very familiar face around ICANN. Uh, he's been around quite a while. Uh, he's had uh, past experience as a GNSO counselor uh, representing the registry stakeholder group. He was the vice chair of the register, uh, registry uh, stakeholder group as well, and then a member of the intellectual property constituency. Uh, Jeff is an unaffiliated member of Norello, and we welcome him to that. And, and you can notice he's the one with the drums and uh, behind him. Uh, also, we have our own uh, Jonathan Zook, who is the vice chair of ALAC and the, also the, um, the vice chair of the ALAC Consolidated Working Group, uh, known. And because of his stuff he does on policy, I believe, I don't know who gave you this name, Jonathan, but you're called a metric man. So metrics, I guess, is, is up your alley. So let me, let me start off with what our goal is today, we, we really want to delve deep in, into the history uh, behind the ICANN accountability and trans, parent, uh, transparency framework. So maybe we can start off with either of you who would like to start off with giving us some context of, of what this framework is, and then we can delve deeper whether it works or not. So uh, who would like to start? Thanks, Glenn. I think it's me, uh, Jonathan Zook, again, here for the record, or as Fadi once put it, uh, metrics man, um, because it's a point that I belabor every time I'm given a microphone that we need more metrics. Uh, for, for probably since 2005, uh, I've been bringing them up. But um, what we want to talk about today a little bit is the ICANN accountability framework. And, and uh, it's always a question how much detail to go into. So I think I wanted to give kind of a high level backgrounder. I, al I also want to limit the amount of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that I bring about in the likes of Cheryl and Aubrey um, when talking about the uh, effort that went into creating this, uh, uh, this framework. Um, so, but uh, certainly welcome questions and discussion and things like that as we go forward, if there are things that are, um, that are not clear. So um, uh, whoever's manning the slides, if you go to the next slide, please. 
So um, the, there was something that was uh, proposed back in uh, 2014 um, uh, that has come to be known as the IANA transition. And at that time, the IANA functions, um, sort of the, the names and, uh, uh, and the numbers part of the uh, ICANN, the numbers part in particular of ICANN is this IANA functions. And it was in many respects considered the last tether that I, the ICANN organization had specifically to the United States uh, government. Um, you know, it, it, ICANN was started um, by the United States Department of Commerce, and there were over the years a number of um, agreements, memorandums of understanding, et cetera, that um, made ICANN gradually more and more uh, independent. And it, and it was definitely envisioned that ICANN would be fully independent um, back in 1998 when it was formed. And it was in fact envisioned that it would happen quite a bit sooner uh, than it did. But it happened over time and incrementally um, as ICANN adopted its own board, et cetera, and became more and more um, independent. And so um, the, um, this final tether, if you will, um, was the IANA functions. And, and that was sort of a momentous occasion. And it was a, uh, a lot of discussion because uh, there were certainly uh, members of Congress in the United States that uh, were freaking out about what the implications of this was. And, uh, um, you know, there were some folks in business and particularly the intellectual property community that uh, uh, were concerned about the implications of this. And so there was a lot of discussion about whether to do it. Um, but one of the most important aspects of this transition is that it was proposed that as part of the transition, there would be the creation of a new accountability framework uh, for ICANN. So in many ways, the United States government acted as a kind of informal uh, accountability backstop um, for the community and for the world. You know, it's like, you know, uh, calling somebody's parent and telling on them was sort of the accountability framework that existed prior to this, where the United States government and the Department of Commerce in particular were sort of like the parent of ICANN. And so changing that relationship and allowing ICANN into adulthood meant really coming up with an organic accountability system for, for uh, ICANN. Uh, next slide, please. So if you think about it, and I apologize for the graphic, uh, when you're limiting yourself to free graphics, you're, you're often limited in your options um, uh, when operating quickly. So I'm sorry, these are all white men in suits. Um, that's not really representative of the ICANN community. Um, but the, I, the effort here is, and, and that is that um, um, as a community, we're, we're often trying to move ICANN. And so um, the, the accountability framework um, was designed to facilitate the community's efforts to kind of move ICANN along. What's unclear from this image, uh, when you look at it though, however, is are we trying to push the boulder up the hill or are we trying to keep it from rolling down the hill? And those are two different types of efforts. One's kind of a proactive effort and one's more of a reactive effort. And that became one of the central conversations that was taking place during this time of developing the, um, um, the accountability framework. And so uh, at one point, uh, there was even a proposal that I can become a membership organization. And um, the, a lot of work and a lot of uh, legal advice went into discussing the possibility that ICANN would become a membership organization such that the SOs and ACs um, would become members of the organization and would have a great deal of what you might call proactive or affirmative control uh, over the organization. But there was, there was pushback from the board and, and in fact from uh, the uh, ALAC on that idea, and, and there was legitimate concerns raised about whether or not um, you know, ICANN could maintain momentum if it, if it was too subject to ups and downs within the community, et cetera. And so it was a, it was a, um, 
that that idea of it being a member organization was rejected. And instead, what were put in place were some fundamental bylaws that gave specifically outlined powers to the community. Next slide, please. And so these are the powers that ended up resulting um, from that process. It's amazing putting two years worth of work um, and uh, you know a 200 page document on a slide. But this is fundamentally what was put in place as a result of um, this effort to build an accountability framework for ICANN. And so the, the, the so-called empowered community uh, empowered by these fundamental bylaws have the, have the following capabilities. One is to reject the budget or strategic operating plans. In other words, when, the, when a final budget or a strategic or operating plan is published, there's an ability to reject this and send it back to the drawing board. And that's part of the reason that um, Xavier does such a rigorous job of getting community input along the way, and he's done a, a terrific job of um, uh, making the development of the budget and the strategic and operating plans a pretty interactive process um, so that there aren't some surprises at the end that would lead the community to want to reject the plan when it came out. The second power is to reject changes to ICANN standard bylaws. So if there was an attempt to change the bylaws, the community has the ability to um, reject these changes and roll them back. The third is to approve changes to fundamental bylaws and or, and or articles of incorporation. The fourth is to remove individual ICANN um, board members. And um, the fifth is to recall the entire ICANN board. So obviously those last two are um, the most dramatic, um, but they're all fairly dramatic uh, in a number of different ways and fairly disruptive to the everyday operations of ICANN when you think about it. So they really are meant to be um, a process of last result if the interactive processes that are put in place um, are, are uh, you know, fall short. So, but uh, certainly removing the, uh, a particular board member or the entire board is, a, uh, is pretty dramatic. The sixth is the ability to initiate a binding, um, uh, to, uh, you know, reconsideration of a board decision or IRP. And so there's always been the ability uh, prior to the transition for a party that is unhappy with a board decision to ask the board to reconsider that decision. And then the board can reconsider it and um, potentially just come out with the same um, conclusion. And so the, the addition that was part of this accountability framework was the ability to bring your, to essentially appeal the decision of a board uh, to an outside body. And so that was a fairly new um, a process to have a binding reconsideration process that involved an external um, third party um, arbitrating the dispute between um, whoever the individual is and, and the board. And uh, so that has the potential to be used uh, more frequently and Jeff will get into some of that in his discussion uh, than some of these other mechanisms. Um, beyond this, the um, the, the only ones that have really been used to date have been requests for documents and information um, you know, during the uh, PIR uh, acquisition debate and things like that. But on the whole, we have not had to invoke um, these, um, these, these more sort of draconian accountability mechanisms. And some might argue that um, they're difficult to use because of how draconian they are. But uh, that, those, that's the framework that's in place. And then finally, we can reject ICANN board decisions related to uh, reviews of IANA functions, including separating IANA away from ICANN if the community starts to believe that ICANN is doing a poor job of managing uh, the IANA functions. And that, that uh, seems the least likely of all. Next slide. 
So one of the questions that came up um, during this uh, two-year conversation about putting it, uh, a framework in place is who watches the watchers? And so um, a lot of this was sort of aimed at the board and, and that was difficult because the board was participating and sometimes was taking this personally. Um, but it, you know, there had been a couple of incidences in which the community were concerned about actions the board had taken. And that's another reason that these powers became sort of reactive. There was a concern about an overly active board in some respects, rather than, for, for example, an inactive board. And so the, so the question then becomes, um, you know, okay, we've put these mechanisms in place to watch over the board. Who keeps the community from um, from uh, from going crazy? And, uh, and then the third conversation um, that was had was about staff accountability. Uh, next slide. So there were some discussions both about board inaction and about staff accountability that were part of this. Um, Workstream one, as it's called now, uh, function, um, the CCWG, um, prior to the transition. Um, but, you know, again, a lot of the pushback is that um, accountability for the staff should go through um, uh, the management uh, uh, of, of ICANN org and ultimately the CEO and then the board, as opposed to coming up with direct accountability mechanisms such as the one that we came up with vis-a-vis -vis the board. And so staff accountability became a discussion as part of Workstream 2. Um, and from that, there was this recognition that, um, uh, that there wouldn't be direct accountability mechanisms so much as an increased level of transparency and um, uh, of how org was managing the priorities and measuring the success of efforts uh, of the staff. And so, so it became as much as anything else a kind of transparency uh, initiative during the Workstream 2 uh, conversations. And uh, I think Jeff will pick up on that a little bit more. Um, but um, it's, it's not something that's been fully implemented yet. And so you, you do have situations that we've just often discussed um, with respect to things that have been moved to staff in terms of um, you know, trying to press staff for the deadline that something will be fully implemented or um, uh, pressing staff for performance metrics associated with it. And, and it's, it's very difficult uh, to do. It's difficult for the community to influence the uh, pace and prioritization of staff because of the structures that are in place. Um, and so uh, there's, there's definitely things that seem to linger uh, for a long time. Questions about uh, new tools, new technology, for example, are areas uh, in which the at-large community has its frustrations. Um, you know, we have the technology task force, we do a bunch of testing on technology, and then we end up waiting years to hear even whether or not uh, ICANN is willing to look at um, a new technology that we've tested. And so there's, there's difficulty in holding staff accountable or um, directly altering their priorities. And, uh, and that's one of the complications associated with the uh, ICANN accountability framework. But at the same time, giving the uh, community sort of direct um, control over staff is not the answer either. So it's not something for which there's an easy answer, but it is something for which the ICANN community has had some frustrations and at large in particular has had some frustrations. Um, and and uh, um, so what I wanna do now is hand it over to Jeff to um, talk a little bit about some examples of, of uh, some of the downsides of, of what might be thought of as almost a loophole um, in the ICANN accountability framework. And then happy to, I, I don't know, actually, if, if you want, if there's questions uh, about this background, I'm happy to do that. I didn't mean to cut you off, Jeff. Uh, if there's questions or clarifications or color commentary from Cheryl or Avri or others that um, want to clarify anything I said, then uh, feel free to speak up now as well. 
Um, otherwise, we'll move to Jeff. Yeah, I'm just looking over the, uh, there's some general comments, but I don't see it as a, a concrete question. Um, I'm just waiting to see if anybody uh, adds anything else in. Um, I really don't see anything. So, you know what, uh, I guess they're absorbing it all. So maybe yeah. we'll turn to Jeff then. Let's go on to Jeff uh, and take it away, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, everyone, for inviting me here. And um, just uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be doing my first presentation. And I think you guys will see me next month as well. So um, it's uh, a sign of me trying to become more involved. Before I get into you know, my slides, I, I want to just add a little bit to what Jonathan said and, and say that it was always intended that ICANN accountability would be an evolution as opposed to a revolution, meaning that it was something that was going to evolve over time. And yes, there were a number of recommendations that were called that were in what was called Workstream One, but we knew at that time there would be a bunch of elements we needed to work on, not just in Workstream Two, which we'll touch on in a, in a little bit, but also. You know, it's it's not something that is static that was ever intended to just be like, OK, we decided these new accountability rules and um, now that's it. It's static and we could just go on and do everything else. It was it was always intended that we would continually strive to do better with accountability, with transparency. And so it's with those kind of um, that kind of background that, that I, I go over some of these next issues. And also, as we go to the next slide, just to let you know that picking up on what Jonathan said, there, there's, um, it's not just the ALAC that has these, these issues with trying to get things out of ICANN staff or get things done. You know, every, I think it's a pretty accurate statement. Certainly every constituency stakeholder group advisory committee that I've been involved in or have observed has the same problems, just, you know, they're, they're, they're different in terms of their, they're different in terms of their priorities. But I, I think it's safe to say that it is a shared um, concern amongst all of the different groups um, that, you know, we strive towards helping to, um, improve and always improve that, that accountability. So if we want to go to the next slide. So the, the first issue, actually, I, I should also kind of um, do a little bit of a disclaimer here. So one of the reasons these issues got aired a few months ago on the um, at-large list was a specific issue that um, a, a organization that I was advising was, was having. And so um, some of these issues, although they come from that specific um, client that I was representing, I brought it up uh, another 500 feet or 5,000 feet or whatever you want to say to, to discuss the overall issues and not the issues as they related to the specific client that I had at that point in time. So I just I want to make that clear that I'm not representing, I'm not doing this to represent a client, um, although some of the issues I'm going to go over were issues that that client had um, at that particular time. So one of the things that we noticed, actually, I should also say that when the bylaws were amended as part of the transition, they initially stated that a reconsideration requests could be brought uh, based on a review of an I can action or inaction. And it didn't define what I can meant. Did that mean just the board? Did that mean the board and staff? Did that mean the community? Um, ultimately, this issue was discussed by the hard work that uh, Jonathan, Cheryl, and so many others in this group worked on. And they realized that, that you know, it was not just intended to apply to the board, but also to, to staff. And so the, there were a number of things that were added to the bylaws, which I sent a, a link around in the chat, that related not just to board action or inaction, but also to staff action or inaction. But one of the provisions in 4.2S of the bylaws um, didn't change from its original version 
other than um, actually it didn't change from the original version. And so therefore, even though the rest of the provisions in that section applies to board or staff action or inaction, this particular section, which relates to urgent requests for reconsideration, only applied to board action or inaction, not staff action or inaction. And um, many of us, believe that that was an oversight and that was something that wasn't intended, but it is the way that it is, uh, is drafted in the bylaws. So what does that mean? So if there is an action or inaction of the board where uh, someone believes that they've been harmed and they believe that um, they need to submit a reconsideration request on an urgent basis because the timelines provided in the bylaws for the regular reconsideration requests are too long, then they may ask the, the Board Accountability um, uh, Mechanisms Committee, the BAMC, for urgent consideration. So in the last um, reconsideration request that was submitted, it had asked for an urgent request, but it was based on staff inaction. And the BAMC came back and said, no, um, only, it, it guess reaffirmed the language of what's in the bylaws, which means that only a board action or inaction can be challenged in an urgent reconsideration request. So no matter what the staff does or doesn't do in the case of inaction, you, someone cannot bring an urgent or make a request for an urgent um, reconsideration request if it's based on staff action or inaction. Again, I don't think that was intended, but um, at the end of the day, um, if, you know, if that was intended, well, that is the language at the end of the day. And if that is something that um, the community wants to look into, it's something that would specifically need to change. The other thing that's interesting is if you examine this a little bit more closely with respect to board action or inaction, what it says is that a requester can file a urgent request for reconsideration within two business days of a board resolution. Okay, that seems, you know, kind of normal and sounds kind of right, but then the question comes up, what if you want to make an urgent request because the board didn't pass a resolution or it didn't act when it was supposed to? You can't do that because if there's no board resolution, there's no urgent request for reconsideration. I think that's important because to me, that's something that says that, you know, what kind of inactions are actually uh, subject to an urgent request for reconsideration? You would think that the most common basis for complaining about board inaction would be the failure to pass a resolution on something you cared about. So I think that's an interesting little um, hole that, that needs to, to be fixed. And if we go to the next um, slide. So sticking with um, the board in action. So, you know, the board has a responsibility in the bylaws um, to, to do a number of things. And I, and I tried to pick out something from, from the, the at-large. And one of the things the board's responsible for doing is to approve changes, modifications to the operating procedures. Well, what if the board doesn't? What if the ALAC presents some changes to the operating procedures, but the board just doesn't do it? The board just doesn't pass a resolution accepting it. It doesn't um, it just do anything. Well, Obviously, you can bring a request for reconsideration, but not on the expedited, expedited timelines of an urgent request. This has really come up a lot, though, um, where you're, you're talking about contractual matters, whether it's with the registries or registrars, where either the staff um, or board fail to take action when they're supposed to take uh, some action. And so, um, Jonathan and I were kind of struggling to come up with other examples, but um, at the end of the day, the, the reality is until someone experiences an issue and then tries to bring in uh, a reconsideration request, sometimes it's hard to, um, 
you know, hard to contemplate what these issues would be. But there is one that Jonathan and I talked about uh, on a number of occasions, and John, Jonathan actually mentioned it just earlier, which was that there have been requests from or to the staff uh, to implement uh, board approved processes such as the um, uh, the ITI, which is, I'm trying to remember what it stands for now. I know it's Transparency Initiative. Uh, I guess it's ICANN Transparency Initiative. If I think I got that first I right. So Information. Ah, information. Thanks. Is that Judith? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Judith. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, there's a number of things where, um, you know, the either the ALAC or individuals from the at-large could bring a reconsideration request for the failure to implement ITI, but just, you know, as we talked about before, not on an urgent uh, basis. So if we go on to the next uh, slide. So this, oh, this didn't come out so great, Jonathan. Sorry about the, the layout here. Um, it was intended to be two different sides. So we'll try to fix that for the um, uh, official version, but, um, Nope, we can go back, sorry. Um, so this is kind of important too, and it wasn't something that we necessarily realized at the time. But in, in 2016, in November 2016, ICANN approved pretty quietly a document called the Delegation of Authority Guidelines. And what that document was intended to do, which is on sort of on the right side of this slide, um, was intended to really distinguish between what are the responsibilities of the ICANN board versus what are the responsibilities of the CEO and the responsibilities of senior management within ICANN. And the interesting thing there is if you dig down into it, there are a number of responsibilities that the ICANN board has delegated to the, the ICANN staff. And some of these, we can certainly understand why they did it, right? One of the things that the ICANN board delegated to staff was contract uh, signatures and the approval of contracts. In 2016 was a time when there were a number of new TLDs, we're not there yet, a number of new TLDs that were approved um, and they all needed contract signatures. And there were a number of, of top-level domains that needed, um, there were agreements that had amendments and all sorts of, you know, normal routine things that go on with contracts and, and, and the, the like. But if you can imagine if the board had to have a resolution and, uh, uh, you know, actually approve all of these contracts and all of these amendments, 1,200 contracts and, and, you know, that many amendments and, assignments and all this other stuff, you can understand why the board delegated uh, that authority to the staff. But one interesting thing happens because of that. Because the board is delegated to the staff, you're not going to have board action or inaction on any of those items. What ends up happening is you have staff action or inaction on those items. So what's the impact there? Well, if the staff is responsible for executing the agreements, then you cannot bring an urgent reconsideration request about that subject if you had a grievance, because it's not the board taking action or inaction, it is the staff acting or not acting, and therefore the urgent reconsideration request doesn't apply. And there are more and more things over the years that the ICANN board has assigned to the ICANN staff or delegated. And um, those things that have been delegated, again, for, for you know, logical, rational reasons, but the more that that's done, the less accountability there is or, or the less availability of the accountability measures you have. So one example that came up and it's currently pending before an independent review is um, uh, actually, it's, sorry, it's not pending before independent review. That's a totally different situation on a different agreement. But the dot-com agreement, um, the recent dot-com agreement, which approved the price change um, was signed by the staff, but it was not subject to a board resolution. So anyone that felt potentially aggrieved by the signing of the calm amendment could not have brought an urgent reconsideration request, again, because there's no board action 
or board inaction, it's really staff action or inaction. So I think, um, and, and Marita brings up a good comment in the chat. Well, isn't staff acting on behalf of the board? Isn't that still the board responsibility and can't want to ledge? Uh, and the answer is no, not on the plain reading of the language. And if you look at the reconsideration request in the dot hip hop case, you will see that ICANN board, the BAMC, strictly adheres to the letter of the language in the bylaws. And so I believe that although it is a good argument to make that um, based on past decisions, it's likely that the board would strictly interpret the language and that being staff uh, action and therefore not subject to accountability. So I'm not sure what's going on with the slides at this point. Um, it's not me that's messing with it. And I know they may be trying to fix it, but uh, so I apologize uh, for that. Uh, and hopefully we'll we'll get this slide fixed in the in the version that gets um, posted, or we'll we'll resend around this one. You can go to the next um, slide, and then I just want to cover quickly before we go to more conversation. Um, you know there are staff uh, accountability recommendations that have not that's in Workstream two, which is uh, now undergoing some work on implementing some of the recommendations or whether um, they're just things that haven't been implemented yet, maybe that weren't included in Workstream 2. And you know, I can go on with an example of that if we have time during the discussion. But one thing that, you know, in going back and reading it and, and, and thinking about what Jonathan was saying about how it's very difficult to get staff to commit to timelines and to commit to dates of when they'll deliver, is in the final report work stream two, there was a recommendation that says, consistent with common best practices and services organizations to standardize and publish guidelines for appropriate timeframes for acknowledging requests made by the community and for responding with a resolution or updated timeframe for when a full response can be delivered. This is one that's interesting because I think this is one that we'd all like to see implemented, but we're all having a tough time getting commitments from staff as to when they're going to implement things that either they've committed to implementing or to acknowledging other requests made by the community. And if you were to just kind of take an informal survey around the community and you ask the community when, um, what are some specific dates that ICANN has committed to in doing whatever it is, whether it's the ITI initiative or whether it's assignment requests or whether it's, um, you name it, every organization has different requests in, I think you'll find uh, a large percentage of those not knowing any dates of when things will either be responded to or finalized. So I, I think that's an important one that we, we may want to address moving forward. Uh, I think that might be the last slide, if I'm not mistaken, if we can just click just to double check. This is the last slide. Yep, great. So I think um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jonathan, but I think it's a good, you know, one of the messages I just wanna leave is that this is always a work in progress. It will always be a work in progress. I'm not trying to criticize you know, staff is obviously working very hard on, on everything, and this is in no way meant to criticize ICANN staff or the board, um, but just an acknowledgement that uh, these principles have always been intended to be uh, evolution, have always intended to be worked on, and we can always do better. And I think that's, that's really the point I wanted to drive home. And uh, and the second point is that the at-large members and ALAC are not alone, that there are many that share in the um, difficulty of getting uh, certain dates and other things uh, agreed to. And I think this is something that the community can all get behind. So Jonathan, I'm gonna turn it back to you, I guess, or? Thanks, thanks Jeff. Um, yeah, and just to add on to what Jeff was saying, I mean, I. The, part of the difficulty is is that um, this is a little bit like government, even though we don't like to think of uh, ICANN as a regulatory body or anything like that. But the staff are almost like the bureaucracy of 
an organization and and the things on which they're working often extend well beyond the tenure of <clears throat> uh, members of the board, um, CEOs, et cetera. So there are projects that are um, have very long timelines, et cetera, that the staff are working on consistently. And I, and I think that, uh, um, you know, part of the difficulty is, you know, what is the shiny new thing and what is it we should be focusing our attention on now? And what do, do we sacrifice in order to give that attention? And, and there aren't clear answers to that. And I, I know that the um, recommendation, uh, there, there are now um, a, a whole slew of recommendations that are sort of on the slate for the improvement of ICANN. All the Workstream 2 recommendations, all the recommendations from the, the, uh, the review of consumer choice, competition, and trust, the security and stability recommendations, the accountability and transparency recommendations. And so one of the efforts that's pending is a recommendation prioritization effort. Um, and so, you know, it's going to be an open question whether um, adding some finesse to these particular Workstream 2 recommendations percolate to the top as, as high priority recommendations uh, to address, because there are so many. There's, you know, 300 of them or something like that right now that are part of that overall recommendation prioritization effort. Um, we're currently um, within the at-large community going through an exercise ourselves um, that Cheryl is heading up uh, uh, as, a, as a small team, uh, like subcommittee of the, um, uh, um, uh, I keep calling it the overhead and budget, but that's not what it is, sorry. Um, but the but the sort of organizational uh, committee that we ha uh, committee that we have uh, finance and budget so operations finance and budget thanks Cheryl uh, a sub team of that is currently going going over these recommendations just to come up with our priorities for re what represents the most important recommendations to address um, most urgently and so one of the reasons to have this conversation is to is to um, make people aware of some of the issues that are out there that it will be addressed by some of these recommendations. And uh, it could very well be that some of these recommendations related to uh, staff accountability should percolate to the top of our prioritization. Um, but as we say, there are many. And so uh, um, this is as much background as anything else. Um, and with that, I guess I wanna leave room uh, for um, Judith's presentation, um, I guess, uh, that, that we skipped over to get to us, but if there's any questions or comments that uh, that you saw, Glenn, um, I, you're, you're technically the moderator, so uh, let me know if there's anything that we can uh, yeah, close um, this I, I think I think um, um, Steve is the most active in his comments, but he's not posing them as a comment. So Steve, do you have a voice? Can you articulate what you're trying to get at? Uh, no, uh, uh, different comments, and I don't know which one you mean. Uh, one of the comments was... Uh, one minute. It's uh, the most recent comment was about um, uh, uh, accountability recommendations, uh, adding more new processes, uh, for example, uh, one recommendation that uh, said that uh, based on best practices, uh, I can staff or board should agree on timelines to respond to community recommendations. And uh, that is a completely new process and uh, framing new guidelines and uh, agreeing to timelines for different, act different uh, uh, situations uh, arising from <coughs> different community um, uh, members or different communities and uh, it will in the end it will amount to another set of uh, procedures and uh, responding or acknowledging a request or a timeline for responding to a request can be um, in many ways like it's like uh, you wanted a computer here is your computer it's delivered now can be a response you wanted a computer we look into that and uh, we have uh, 
commission the team to look into that as another response we have received your letter as another response in between there are different kinds of responses all that would amount to compliance so what uh, we have done is uh, adding more processes and uh, what used to take 3 months now take 6 months which will again take 12 12 months in the future and instead uh, we should have uh, thought of uh, designing an all new style of uh, working for i can i don't know what what we call that by the conventional uh, definition of accountability this is what we do but we need to do something else alt- altogether thank you so seva uh, i i just want to ask you directly do you believe that uh, i can is moving in the right direction in terms of accountability and transparency or do you see issues that should be brought up no my overall comment is not negative i can is moving in the right direction it definitely is moving in the right direction in fact i'm a great admirer of uh, the progress that i can has made in such a short time as 30 years so since 1998 and um uh these are things that take uh, a lot of time it's a whole new process like a, a, a government process um it's it's a multi stakeholder process and uh, it's happening fast but not fast enough and so that is uh, uh, es- essentially my commitment and uh, the another uh, serious comment that i would make is that uh, we go by existing processes that exist somewhere else whereas for i can which is a uh, internet uh, uh, numbers coordination body which is a global co- uh, multi stakeholder body there are no precedents there are no examples anywhere you can't copy google you can't copy united states government but that is what we have been doing all these years and we have to change and we have to do something else completely something else that's okay. my comment thank you Great, thanks. Uh, uh, I just want, I'm conscious of the time. As you, those who are looking at the chat, this is a 90-minute call. That's what we put in the agenda from the beginning. So uh, maybe the email went out that it said 60 minutes. That's uh, not the case. But we set this up when we have um, a debate or a discussion or something as serious as this. We give it a, a little bit longer for people to to uh, jump in. So um, back over to you, Jonathan. Um, So did you see anything in the discussion or comments from Siva or anything from Jeff that you agree or or strongly disagree with uh, what's your opinion I I I in my case um I, Marita also has her hand up uh, Glenn so um but um as far as Jeff's presentation I th- I think I'm inclined to agree with the things he's saying and and I think that the um the challenge for us as, as is so often the case and in some ways what Siva is touching upon is that there are so many proposals for things that we could be doing differently that um how to prioritize them is going to be one of the biggest challenges right and and so um you know with 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 all that we have going on um wh- you know wh- where where are the uh the thorniest problems if you will and and I don't have I don't have the answers to that question um I feel like that's um the biggest challenge facing the community is that there's there's now been so many recommendations for things that could be done to improve um the organization and including different ways to improve its accountability and transparency um that um uh that prioritizing those things is going to be uh a really critical step. So thankfully Cheryl's heading up that effort for the at large, but even after that we'll be joining uh Xavier uh, uh who's who's the CFO for those who don't know the CFO of uh ICAN is doing an organization wide effort to prioritize those recommendations. And I think that that um and we'll be sending delegates if you will to that effort and uh and so things do take a long time um when in a multi-stakeholder model um but uh, i i think this is certainly an issue and and one that leads to some frustrations and uh uh as jeff said not just for the at large but definitely including the at large because that's who we are um and it's going to just be a question of where it falls um from a standpoint of prioritization 
Um, Marita, I, I go ahead. Uh, Glenn, you can call in Marita. <laughs> Marita, for the sake of everyone, she's uh, the Norello ALAC member. So over, and she's been deeply involved with multi stakeholderism. So over to you, Marita. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah, just along the same kind of lines that he, that uh, Jonathan was uh, was bringing up. That well, time is time is our, our our problem here, and and uh, we've got too many things to do um, over too short with too few people uh, over too short a time frame, or we would like it to go faster for sure. I think Jeff seems to be looking for. Um, some kind of time frame uh, that could be attached to um, things that need to be done, and I think that's kind of dangerous. It 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 feels like like not all things are equal in that way, and I think that's where Jonathan was going. You know, there's there's got to be a priority. We're working on the priority um, issues here, and that some things are going to be higher up on that time frame than others. So it's just not going to be all equal, although I don't pretend to uh, really totally understand the issue uh, that Jeff has been explaining. It is complex. Thank you. Great. Thank you, um, Marita. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, give their comments and uh, whether they agree or disagree with either of our speakers today. Uh, Cheryl, you're more than welcome to, to jump into the fray. If you would like to stir it up a bit, that'd be great. Oh, you you actually want me to stir things up, Jeff? Gee, that's, that's, that's a worry. Okay, right. Well, I'm not sure I'll stir things up, but I'll see how I go. Um, look, I, I think we also need to recognise uh, with these tensions and these, uh, they're not actually competing interests. The interests are often aligned, but the competition mm -hmm is for resourcing, right? And that's very much uh, where this backlog of all, in many cases, worthy and often, not always relevant, even at the time, recommendations made by so many things, including coming out of uh, the accountability and transparency uh, processes, which we know is a work stream one and work stream two now. Um, all of that important work creates a big bag of stuff to do. Um, and it's also mixed up with existing stuff that was still being done or needed to be queued to do or whatever. And so it's the resource management and the rationalisation, or as I like to continually call it, triage. Look at what you've got, what you can do with what you've got, and what order you can do things in. Um, and if that leaves some dead in the corner, fine. Um, if that leaves some dying in the corner, equally fine. And I mean that literally with human lives. That's what triage does. So I certainly think you can do it with things um, as less life and death um, as some of what we've got on our slate of things to do um, with these prioritisation exercises. But where we are now is we've got a backlog to clear. That's very much what ATR, T3 dug into and made its recommendations about. And we also need to, at the same time, in my very biased view, set in place more predictable, more transparent, totally acceptable processes that people understand, including the interactions of courtesy and communication. Jeff has been outlining um, under 2.2. Um, and all of those things also in parallel need to be put into place. It's no good just spending a whole lot of time clearing the backlog and then going, oh dear, and we now need to start this. You've got to do both those things in some form of complementarity. Sorry about that. And so resourcing right back at the beginning has to look at clear the backlog and get the better model going. Simple. <laughs> Not. Great, thank you. And, and it looks like everybody's really appreciating the triage uh, expression. I'm not sure if I can as on the deathbed, but uh, I think the meaning as, as cognizance. Uh, if those who have been following the 
uh, ISAW Governance Committee, we have 185 recommendations and we're slogging through that. So it's, uh, I can appreciate uh, the use of this term. Uh, what, uh, moving forward, we are gonna go to about seven more minutes and uh, let just to let uh, Jeff and um, Jonathan comment on anything that has been said so far. And then we're gonna have Judith do her quick report on uh, what she was uh, uh, doing with the NOMCOM and then final statements by both of our speakers. So uh, uh, Jonathan, did you want, or Jeff, which of you two want to carry on and re response to Cheryl or anyone else? Uh, Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to respond. I think we need to separate the big issues, the, the, the big meta issues from the everyday kind of communications, right? So, so yes, right, things like there are big things that we need to prioritize, whether that's the next round, whether that's SAD, whether that's, you know, um, the, the human rights initiatives, that's all well and good, and that's all subject to the prioritization. I think what Jonathan and I are also talking about, though, are the little common sense courtesy things, right? So things that are already on their plate. You know, when someone sends me an email and they're asking for something, there's a couple common sense and courtesy things to do. One is to acknowledge that you've received it, and the other is provide a response that includes a time to, to that, that you'll be able to handle it. Right? I'm not talking about someone who sends an email to ICANN staff saying, when are you going to implement the SAD? Okay, that, that's a big, big, big thing. Right? I'm talking about, and Jonathan and I were discussing, uh, you know, the, the lesser, um, more day-to-day -day type things. When anyone sends a communication to ICANN staff saying, you know, when can I get this assignment approved? When can I, when can we get the foreign translation of this document out? When can we understand, you know, can we get a date by which we need to know how many people we're going to be sending to this meeting, right? Whatever it is, they're, they're, what, what we're talking about is not just tied to the big prioritization exercise, but it's also to the smaller every day-to-day -day things where um, the day-to-day -day stuff needs to get done. So yes, there is the big things like um, the, the reconsideration request for ur urgent request. That's a bigger item that can, that can wait, that, that can be prioritized. But, but the things that a day-to-day -day organization needs, I think, again, courtesy and common sense are rules that the staff can live by to respond. And Jonathan, if you could just go over a couple of the examples of things that you've been asking for for years that we're not talking about necessarily, um, you know, huge. Anyway, I'll turn it back over to you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And I, I, I think there are certainly um, small items, but um, I, I guess, I guess there's. Um, It's, it's not always easy to know what the constraints are that staff find themselves under and, and what, what leads to the type of communication that transpires. But I do know that, for example, the technology task force uh, for at large has made requests for threaded discussion tools like Slack and has been making those requests for the better part of six years. And the response is, um, uh, I can't staff are evaluating the top possible tools. And that's literally the sum total of the response. Not what tools are they evaluating, how many tools they plan to evaluate, how long they plan to spend evaluating them, and when we might hear an answer as to the results of that evaluation or what that report might look like, just that staff are evaluating possible tools. And so that is a difficult, answer for the at-large to internalize and operate uh, operate around. Another example we had that's, uh, that's technology related has to do with ICANN's new content management system. Um, that, uh, that system's coming along great and, and uh, many of us have participated in providing feedback 
uh, to the folks that are working on that content management system that has begun to roll out. And it's very exciting. Um, but at the same time, the at-large has very little sense, even in terms of years, when that system might be applied to uh, our content. So in other words, we haven't even been given the year in which that technology might be applied to our content, the year. And there's, and there's a steadfast refusal to provide that type of assurance. Because if we had it, we could make plans like, okay, it's gonna take five years, then we need to look at an interim solution because we have unique content management needs because of our Rollo and ALS structures in terms of getting consistent materials out to the field for outreach and things like that. And so, so we have a need that is immediate and they have a technology which is not, and understandably is not immediate, but, but the refusal to even give the year in which it might be available um, is, is, is problematic. And so it's not necessarily always, as Jeff said, that it's a small thing. The project itself, uh, you know, this content management system is a big multi-year implementation. There's no question. What, what, what seems like a relatively small thing is to engage more with the community in terms of expectations management around the things in which they're engaged. And that's what I think Jeff means um, by, you know, courtesy and common sense in a sense is how best to communicate with the community in such a way that that information is, is in fact valuable for the plans that the community itself needs to make. So that's, that's just some ideas. I don't have any great summation. This is, a, this is a, not even the start. I wanted to say this is the start of the conversation, but this is really the, uh, the continuation of a conversation that has been going on for some time and will continue to go on going forward. But uh, um, Eduardo asked us to uh, bring it uh, here to the Neuralo and uh, to get people's juices flowing and thinking about this as we, uh, as we figure some of these things out. And hopefully that's been uh, useful. Thanks uh, again on behalf of Jeff uh, and me uh, for, the, uh, for the opportunity to present to the group. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Jeff, uh, I believe Siva had a short uh, interjection. Uh, uh, Siva, go ahead. Uh, two quick points. Uh, one reason why there is uh, 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 an absence of response or a slowness of response from staff or board is that uh, they're very, very cautious especially because of the especially because of the accountability processes because of the processes if someone says something he'll get into trouble if a board member supports something he or she might get into trouble so that has to be looked into and the second comment that i want to make is uh, emphatically that uh, nothing like i can has ever existed before and a similar organization does not exist anywhere so we have to think of all new processes and all new organizational design and an accountability process that will design something rather than specify processes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and I, uh, Jeff, you have a, a wrap up comment as well. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, yeah, this is a great discussion. It's an evolution, as I was saying, things can always get better. And one thing I'd love to see as I was starting to write in the chat is oftentimes I can and the community views itself as being in a bubble, but I can has real responsibilities, real day-to-day um, -day, uh, decisions and things that it needs to do that impact individuals, organizations, and businesses. And so when it's making decisions, or when it's um, engaging in discussions on things it needs to do, it really needs to consider the impact of either doing something or not doing something on those third parties and, and, and people, organizations and individual, uh, people, businesses and organizations outside of that bubble. And I think that that would be a huge step forward uh, move, uh, as we move on. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have two things and then we're wrapped up. Um, uh, Judith, can we call on you to talk about the NOMCOM update and then I'll turn it back over to Eduardo. Sure, thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, happy to talk about the NOMCOM. So the, um, we are coming to the end. We have one more month 
left, a, a, a little less than a month left for the NOMCOM evaluations to end March 9th. So far, we've only gotten one application completed for um, the North American ALAC and one nomination completed for board. Um, many of, we had over 50 people start applications, but they have not completed them. And so we wanted to get the word out to everyone and everyone and, and everyone, their brother, to please